Shalom, shalom. Hope you had a good Pesach. Yes, it was beautiful. Yeah? Good. Thank you for the Shmura Matzah, Rabbi. Oh, with pleasure, with pleasure. I'm glad, I'm glad I managed to get it to you. Could thank, thank Lorraine, she brought it to you. Oh, thank you, Lorraine. And I wish to come by one day soon and get my book from you. Oh, yes, I still got to get you a book. I should have given it to Lorraine to drop off. Oh, uh, that's okay. okay. I'll come by. Good, good. Let's begin. Okay, are we ready? Uh, book. Yeah, sorry. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Maria. How are you? Good, thank you. Okay. Hi, Maria. Hi. Hi, Esther. Okay. Okay. Middle, are we ready? Middle, before we start, can I just tell you? I, I happen to, yeah, I happen to. I happened to watch a, uh, uh, I happened to watch a Rabbi Friedman talk about the soul and the and the body and the thing that, and the thing that came out of it so clearly was that when you've got a bo the body it dies but the soul lives on forever so when the soul moves on to another body you still remember things from the previous person because it's a living being, but the soul, but the body is obviously dust to dust and it's been buried. That's not, not yeah, okay. Um, I'll go off the line now. This is gonna be more relevant in our yeah. next lesson. Now I'm not gonna say next week because I'm not sure if this particular class will take us one, this lesson will take us one week or two weeks to do. Yeah. But in lesson five, we're going to focus on reincarnation and things like that. Okay. So in this session, we're not going to talk about reincarnation. We don't want to get derailed, but we're going to have the next week will be dedicated. And that's all that, that what you're discussing will be very relevant to that discussion. Okay. Okay. Let's begin. We're going to start on page 128 beyond our reality. So just um, a reminder that our shiur is dedicated in loving memory of Noah and Avram Yehuda Leib. And second, just make sure we were on Zoom can also see the screen. Okay, for those of you on Zoom, could you just quickly please confirm for me that you could see only the PowerPoint and my face? Is it yes, all clear? Rabbi. Just one... Good. You see the journey of the soul and that's it, right? Yes. Okay, good. Lesson four in heaven's name. Okay, great. So um, so both those, those of you on Zoom, once again, um, I've got your questions. Everyone will be able to hear your questions. If you ask a question, if you say, write something in the chat, I might not see it. So you might have to unmute yourself if you have a question. And I'll try to um, repeat the questions of people if, if, uh, if you can't hear. Or if you want me to repeat something, then I'd mute yourself. Others try to say unmute. It'll be easier for everyone to, he to hear. And um, uh, I won't get too much in the way. Okay, let's get straight into it. Um, we're going to start with um, a fascinating topic tonight. Our topic is the topic of the topic of heaven, hell. Well, it says reincarnation, but reincarnation is not going to be this lesson. I'll, I'll have to edit that. So, what are we talking about? What happens to the soul in its new reality, and how? Do we understand life after death? So here's a video. I actually, for those of you that were at my Mashiach Sudha, which is the meal that we had at the end of Pesach, I actually spoke about this particular video already. But I think it's quite an eye-opening idea. Please try.
Mendel, you muted. So if you can unmute, thanks. I'll mute again. Yep. Sorry, those on the video on the Zoom, did, did you say you can't hear? Are you hearing okay? No, Rabbi, I can't hear. You can't hear. Okay, sorry. I can hear your voice, but can't hear the, the video, the movie. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm you, you are online again. We can hear you now. Thanks. Not the video. But you're not the video. Okay, I have to redo the setting. Sorry, I put in the wrong setting. Sorry. Oh, geez. Oh, one more time. I don't want to waste your time. Um, Okay, let's try one more time. It doesn't work. Ah. Okay, apologies. Let's see, it should work now. You can hear can now, Rabbi. Thank you. Birth and death are as contradictory as night and light, but they are strangely associated with an identical Hebrew word, kever. Kever means a tomb where a body is buried. But kever also means a womb where life is formed. A womb is a gateway to life, while a tomb is a gateway to afterlife. But is there an afterlife? Or does laying a body to rest in a grave mark the absolute end? If it were within our power to interview a soul, we would undoubtedly glean insight into afterlife. Instead, we have chosen to eavesdrop on a set of twins in their mother's womb to shed some light on the before life. Hey twin, I'm scared of birth. Why? It's the end of existence. We get ejected. We're finished. 
I'm also anxious, twin, but I'm not scared. Birth is supposed to be a transition to the real life. Huh. Don't give me the hiccups with your afterbirth real life fantasies. How can life be supported without an umbilical cord and amniotic fluid? Well, maybe it's a radically different form of life. Maybe we won't need the cord. I wish you were right. I keep kicking that thing away from my neck. Stop spinning for a minute and imagine, twin. After birth, we will enter a ginormous universe filled with light and with air that we will breathe through our mouths. Come on, grow some brain cells, will you? Mouths are not for breathing. Besides, if your postnatal paradise existed, why has no one ever returned from that realm? Forget it. Once we leave here, we collapse into cold, dry nothingness and wither into eternal gloom. I don't think Mother would allow that to happen. She nurtures us in this cozy womb. She sends us nutrients for months on end. For what purpose? Just to end it all with birth? No, Mother has greater plans for us than that. Now you're beginning to sound infantile. Do you see a mother lurking in some corner of the womb? Not a trace. Show me a mother. And as for your nutrients, can't you feel that annoying cord? Don't exchange empirical for fantastical. Thankfully, these two delightful infants made it safely to the other side. They grew up in the universe that one had described and the other had denied. And until today, they continue their clamorous debate. It is only that the topic of contention has slightly shifted from is there life after the womb to is there life after the tomb? Okay, so I can't tell you how um, true Kevin. Kevin over Kevin. Stay Kevin. Kevin over Kevin. Who? Um, yes, Kevin for. And that's that's exactly what we're the point of this thing. There's two types of Kevin. The womb. So Nikah Kevin. Rechem to Kevin. Ken. One of, the, one of the names of a rechem, of a womb, is a kever, and that's what we're saying in Hebrew, Russian Polish. Yes, sometimes it's called a kever. So that's why it comes from the same, same. it's a, it's a stage before and after, after life. It comes from, it's called a kever. Okay, so um, I found this video so, so, so powerful, so important, because so often you try to tell people about something that's not in their reality, and they say, no, no, you're talking about fantastical stuff. You're talking about crazy stuff. I don't believe that stuff. But this is exactly, this video is so true to how, if you had the intelligence that you have today, in theory, in your womb, what would you think about life afterwards? Life after the world with intelligence that we have, it's just a mind shift. And we have to uh, change the way we think of it in order to properly understand it. So when we're going to be talking about the next three classes, when we're now talking, we're going away from halakha per se, away from personal experience, and now we're going into the, the world of Kabbalah, the world of afterlife, and what else is going to happen. Sometimes you might think, oh, this is beyond, this is not, uh, this is fantastical. But it's not fantastical when you change your perspective and you realize that you were a soul beforehand, you lived beforehand, you entered your mother's room, and at that point, everything changed for you. And if that can change, and you came into being as a being from out of nowhere, where did you come from? Where were you before that? Where were you before you were born? If you could understand that and understand that you existed before and then you somehow came into being, not just through the uh, DNA connection of uh, conception, but actually through uh, something you must have been somewhere beforehand, you didn't just pop into existence, then perhaps you can understand that you're going to continue to exist afterwards. You won't just pop out of existence. Just like you can't pop into existence, can't pop out of existence. And that's perhaps a good gateway for understanding this afterlife area where we're going to talk about three concepts in afterlife, our next three lessons. It might not be three weeks, three lessons. First one, we're going to talk about the first stage, which is the heaven and hell process. What is heaven? What is hell? The next thing, 
Well, in the next lesson we're going to discuss is the concept of reincarnation, which is a later stage, what actually that means. And the final stage that we're going to discuss is the concept of resurrection and what that means. Okay. So as I say, all this sounds fantastical, but that's only because of your mind, our minds as human beings, my mind, that's where we are. So we have to stretch our minds a bit to try to understand this and appreciate it. My phone is making a lot of noise. I should maybe turn it off. Okay. So let's look at lesson learning exercise number one. Learning exercise is 4.1. What do I think or about the Jewish view on the afterlife? You may have decided to answer that already or go through some type of discussion. Um, you don't have to uh, per se say anything. Um, Um, when you think of the afterlife, do you have any preconceived ideas? That's the idea of one of you. The second question is what I would like to know about the Jewish view on afterlife. So what do you know about? Think about what you already know about it. And let's see if it's going to change. The idea is to see if we can help you change that a bit. Not because it's a family. Okay. Um, all right. If anybody wants to uh, add anything to this, the question that we're going to now have is another exercise. Let's look at exercise number two. We'll get straight into exercise number two, and these will help us understand the topics we're going to do. Um, page 129. What word idea, or idea immediately enters your mind when you hear the word help? You're welcome to share your answers with us. Suffering. 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 Cleaning. Okay. Cleaning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Purgatory. Purgatory. What, what is purgatory? What do you think of it? That's another translation of the same word. What is purgatory? What do you think when you think of the word purgatory? You don't think. When somebody says, oh, he's gone to hell, what do you think? The devil. The devil. Common answers. Okay. Anything else? Well, you suffer. Well, you, you see suffering. So you say suffering, cleansing, hell, devil. An unhappy place. An unhappy place. Okay. So let's see if this will actually change the way you perceive this. Um, now, I think that a lot of us are familiar with the concept of reward and punishment in Judaism. Um, reward and punishment is fundamental to belief in Judaism. And let's look at that first. That's going to be our first text for today. Um, oh, actually, there's another exercise. You're welcome to do it if you want. Actually, it's, you know what? It's a good exercise to do it. I forgot about it. We could do it quickly as well. Um, rate the following according to the degree of pleasure they um, would provide. Otherwise, number one, the least pleasurable and the most. So when we think of pleasure, this is going to help you ready for the second part of the class when we talk about heaven. Um, do you think happiness in general? What type of pleasure do you get when you're happy? If you the thought of going on a Hawaiian cruise, a lifetime of meaning, a lifetime of membership to an exclusive country club, country club, love, social status, wealth, wisdom. All what above. all above? No, no, but what level? Are they all equal? Are they all equal? You can write yourself. What do you think of that list would have given you the most amount of pleasure? Huh? Health 10. Health 10? Most pleasure. You... Health is not here. There's no health. Health oh, doesn't give you pleasure, by the way. Health is a you constant. It's a, we take it for granted. Well, you're healthy. Yes. You, you, realize it you, you may get pleasurable when you lose it, and God forbid, and it comes back. Um, wealth. If you do wealth, a lot of people spend their life searching for wealth. Um, so maybe that gives people a certain amount of what would you put as the most amount of pleasure that you think you got in your life? Yeah. Love. Yeah. Love. Okay. Well, that, that's what you put in Hawaiian cruise. 
What what are you putting the highest? Love? You think wisdom gives you? You know what? Okay. I, I prefer to say all, all of those in the whole lot, 10 out of 10. Of Happiness, wealth, all of wisdom, yeah. all of them give you 10 out of 10. But which are the most out of all those? That's the question. Happiness. Happiness. Okay, happiness. Some people say love, happiness. All right. Okay, so we're going to get back to this particular exercise. We'll, 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 let's go on. And so let's let's let look at what, how we look at reward and punishment in uh, Judaism. Now, I think you're all familiar with um, Maimonides, right? Maimonides, possibly the greatest Jewish rabbi in history, the one that codified was a, you know, encyclopedia. He made a encyclopedia of Jewish law, probably the first encyclopedia ever to be written. Um, 14 books organized Jewish law. That's his greatest achievement, but he also wrote incredible other things. One of the things that, one of the other small things that he did is he set up the, what's known as the 13 principles of faith, which means that um, from Rambam's understanding, these are fundamental concepts that a Jew should believe in. These are fundamental to Jewish belief. In other words, there's certain things that say, um, do you have to believe that the world is 6,000, just under 6,000 years old, even though that's what Torah believes? No, you don't have to believe it. You could still be following Judaism or not. But if you go against one and don't believe one of the 13 principles of faith, as a Jew, we, according to Rambam, these are not something that you could argue on. These are fundamental facts to Judaism that are not arguable. Okay? Um, that's, that's an example. So these are facts and really important to believe. Not only that, some people say these in their daily prayer. Uh, and if you go to non Chabad shuls, after shul on Shabbat, they sing, that, that's actually the 13 principles of faith. That's how central they are to Jewish belief, accepted throughout orthodoxy, throughout mainstream Judaism. Okay, so let's look at them. Um, text 1a on page 113. The 11th principle of the 30 principles of Jewish faith is that God, blessed be he, rewards those who observe the commandments of the Torah and punish those who transgress its prohibitions. So if somebody says, well, I'll do what I want and I don't believe in reward and punishment, no, fundamental. Why is it so important? Right? So the reward is both during life and after life. Reward and punishment is the concept of reward and punishment. So we believe in this concept. No one can deny that, concept, that idea. Now, text 1b, um, he goes on to say, In other words, we get rewarded in this world, yes, but the real reward and punishment in this way is really felt, where it's really palpable, is actually in the world to come. It's far more powerful, far more, more meaningful in the world to come than in this particular, particular world. If you can say to sugar and reject that, then you're forgiven. And then what? Okay, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. That's a good question. Um, yes, to shiva helps to lessen that. To shiva helps to lessen how much you could only to shiva means to repent, to change your ways. And yes, it says, if it says if you do to shiva on your deathbed, then you could overcome the punishment, so to speak, to a certain degree, but we don't really like the word punishment, but although we do use the word schar of honest, so we're going to take it, but we want to understand what that actually means. That's going to be our discussion tonight. Um, now, when we spoke about rating higher on pleasure, right, when we did that exercise about which things you, it gives you more pleasure, we all started and we said love. And then some people said things like happiness or wisdom. And most people didn't say things like wealth as the highest level of pleasure. It is for a lot of people. Right, you have an experience oh. that you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Okay. But obviously there's a certain satisfaction that people get from wealth. But if somebody's very wealthy, but they have no love, it's, it's difficult to understand how happy most people would rather be loved 
and have good relationships and be wealthy, although we don't always aware of it. And most people destroy their relationships because of wealth, um, unfortunately. But when we think in clear minds, objectively, we understand. And that teaches us something that there's physical things like Hawaiian cruise is wonderful. We'd all love to go on one. And uh, social status is wonderful. And wealth is wonderful. All good pleasures, we'd all love that. But when you think about truly what makes a person a lifetime of meaning, happiness, um, love, things like that, usually are, are deeper. Why is that important? Because those are things that you have even after you pass away. And then you don't have, there's no Hawaiian cruises after you pass away. There's no more wealth. Uh, there's, it's not a tangible. And therefore, it's, it's, it's far greater. It's far more important to your place and who you are. And that makes things, that, that makes it far, far more important. That's how we could realize. How therefore, when you go, uh, uh, when you live a life which is removed from physicality and you only sp experience the spiritual, that's going to be, have a big impact on you. Is that clear? Okay, let's go on. So we're looking at reward and punishment. Um, reward. So if you have a lack of any spirituality in your life, a person is going to be miserable. Spiritual pleasure is much more intense and be pales in comparison. So therefore, the reward and punishment in this world are far, um, are far less important than the, the, that of the, the world to come. Um, so let's look at how the Rakanti is going to express this when it comes to um, it comes to the concept of punishment. But before that, I actually want to introduce this text. We're up to text one thirty uh, on page one thirty four, text two. But we're going to now discuss the concept of hell. Okay, the life of concept, what we define as hell. Um, when I say the word hell or genom, people get uncomfortable. People don't like hearing that word. It's not a comfortable terminology for people. In the old days, people would speak about it. To be honest, in Chabad, we rarely speak about this part. There's certain Jewish sects that emphasize this. Okay? <laughs> I'll tell you a, a cute story. I can actually show you a video of it. But um, my brother-in-law became world famous again recently. He's a shliach, he's a rabbi in Orlando, Florida, by Disney World and whatever. And for Pesach, there was thousands of religious Jews that came to Florida because there's great houses over there, whatever, from New York. And there was a flight which was packed with religious Jews that had come for Pesach, and the flight got delayed and delayed and delayed. Meantime, these people were out. There's no kosher food in the terminal. I saw that at the airport. At the airport, that's my brother-in-law, yeah. So, so anyway, he went, what he did is they, he couldn't get through customs or not through customs, but through security to the gate, right? And he wanted to bring food for like 200 people. They, they hadn't had food. So he, somebody called them and told them that they were stuck and they'd been waiting about 10 hours without a flight, without meals. So he organized, he quickly, him and his wife, my Chaimushka sister, they got food together. And now the question is, how do you get it through security? So he couldn't figure out how to get a security. What he did is he bought a ticket for him and his son, and they took it through security, and then they served everybody. Okay, and then everyone got food. So it was like 200 people. Um, now, if you see like the people post, and I saw a picture of what somebody writes, oh, Rabbi Kanikov and Mrs. Rabbi and Mrs. Kanikov, they surely have a great reward in the world to come. And it's funny because a Chabad person would never write such a thing. Okay, I'm sure they do, but they did a great mitzvah. Chabad were taught when you have an opportunity to help somebody, you help somebody. It's not like we value, is this going to give me a good reward or not? It's not part of our, it's not the way we train. Although some Jews may think of that. That's the way you train kids maybe, but not the way we learn. We learn that we do it because it's the right thing or not. But it was just funny. So that's why in Judaism, there's times that we focus on this and it seems petty. It seems petty, but it is a principle. And that's why we discuss it. That's why we won't normally discuss it in our classes, the concept of reward and punishment in Chabad classes. In certain areas, they do. In Sephardi circles and Musur style circles, it's much more emphasized, but not in Chabad. But it doesn't mean it's not true. It certainly is true. 
it's just where you want to focus the duties. And we don't want people doing, we don't, we don't feel like it's right for people to do it because they're trying to get a reward in financial. We think that today most people are beyond that. But it still sounds petty, but it still is important to understand. Okay, so when we talk about God to, uh, punishing us or taking account, it sounds like, well, if he really cares about everything I do, like, you know, he's a big God, he everything. Why does he care? So here's the first thing I want to tell you. There's another principle within Judaism. And that other principle in Judaism is that God is kind and he's good. Now, parents love their children. At least most parents do. But even a good loving child, sorry, a good loving parent that loves a child, normally when they discipline their child, they're doing it out of love. But sometimes we can lose our temper and get angry and do things that we shouldn't. Okay? That's a fact. And we should be mindful of that, that we sometimes make mistakes as parents. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't lose his temper and make mistakes. He's the parent that loves always, and every single action that he does is with perfect love. That's a fundamental principle. So therefore, if you have that principle, how does that line up with the concept of people dying and suffering? For the sake of suffering, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up. Automatically, you see that there's something wrong, which tells us that our understanding of hell from a Jewish perspective or eternal condemnation or internal purgatory or suffering is simply not a Jewish concept. It doesn't fit with the more important principle. It's like you can't say if a parent truly loved their child, they wouldn't say, listen, you acted so bad. That's it. I'm sending you off in a far off uh, uh, island to, to suffer the rest of their life. No normal parent would do that. It just doesn't exist, right? Even if the person child was bad, they would do something, what would they do? What they do is, you know, when a child messes up, a pa parent that is thinking clearly, they'll, they'll, they'll discipline the child. If the child needs a punishment in order to learn their lesson, they'll give the child the punishment. But they're not doing it because they want to harm the child. They're not doing it because they want the child to suffer. They can't handle the child suffering. As a matter of fact, sometimes the punishment, the discipline is harder for the parent than it is for the child because they love the child. Right? So why are they doing it? Because they need the child to learn the lesson. They want to help the child. They're doing it out of love. That's why, by the way, we have a different course, which I haven't thought of doing yet, but I thought of it. The fundamental concept within parenting is that everything, including discipline, which has to be done, has to come from love. The same thing is when we talk about punishment within Judaism. It's not punishment. There's no such thing as suffering, as God doing suffering. It doesn't exist. So if that's the concept, then we automatically understand that our understanding of hell, of Gehenom, is totally different to the way other religions may be uh, displayed or the way people normally talk about it, about these big fiery furnaces and things like that. Even though you might find those type of texts in Judaism, you always have to put them into context. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so the answer to your question so uh, Violetta is asking a good question so based on what I'm saying there's no hell and the answer is you're correct there's no hell no hell as people perceive it there's a concept called Gehenna and as Fritz beautifully said at the beginning it's cleansing I know some people looked at him and said what are you talking about because it doesn't fit with most people's understanding the concept of hell. It's a cleansing system. It's there to help you. It's a rehab. Rehab. Is rehab fun? Nobody wants to be in rehab. Nobody wants to be rehabilitated. But it, it's painful. It's annoying. But it helps the person go through it. Do people suffer there? Only if they choose to suffer. Okay. Okay, so in other words, no, in one, one second, in other words, in other words, is there suffering? If somebody goes to rehab, let's just take the rehab example. If somebody goes to rehab and some people say, I'm suffering over here, right? But that suffering might be teaching you how to walk again. It might be teaching you how to stop your addiction. Yes, it's suffering, but if you're a person that has the right sense of perspective, says, it's difficult, it's annoying, it's not comfortable, I wish I didn't have to do it, but I appreciate how it's helping me. And therefore, you look at it the same way, you look at pregnancy. 
pregnancy is annoying. It's uncomfortable. You could say you're suffering. Or you could say I'm bringing a new life into the world. Say that about life. Say that about life. That's what it is. That's a change. It's a bit extreme. The heat's a bit higher. It's a bit more tough. The, the, the so level. The child can be in their known for help. A bit. Uh, okay, so we are here blessing for the Nishama, and then he can transfer himself from their known to the next. Okay, we haven't got to that yet. The answer is yes. Yeah, we have this. Yeah, yes. Yes, 100%. That's right. About the okay, we're not going to talk about Kappa Kela just yet. Kappa Kela is means it's like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's basically part of the stages of health. Okay. What is this? Yes, it could be very thing. You know, some people love to tell people about all the details of health. And how if you don't do this, there's this book that says that people go through this suffering and it's called Kapakele. And Chabad doesn't do that. We don't do that. We're not here to scare you. We call here to teach you how to love Judaism and to tell you, yes, there is results when you don't do what you're supposed to do. There is, there is, there is, there is, we call it cause and effect. Okay. There is effects of your negative actions. That's what there is. We're not going to start telling you, you know, what's going to happen to you. You're going to burn and there's one finger at a time. We're going to start. We're not going to start going. We're not going to start giving you details. So Kappa Kella, so some people, if you want to know, do some people go through some really harsh things? Possibly. But I don't like learning those things. If it helps you, if you really are, the only time you would learn such a book is if you're really struggling and you feel like the only way it's going to help you overcome a particular test. You're addicted to something. The only way you think you're going to come to overcome a particular test is by learning those things. Fine. Good for you. For today's, most people in today's saying, I don't think it's going to work. Okay. All right. So, yes. Isn't that an idea of hell and purgatory? I think that came from Christianity because they invented all. It's not, it doesn't come only from Christianity. Christianity is not fully to blame for it. Judaism is also, because Judaism taught the concept. Some people took it out of perspective. Judaism writes about it. And some people misunderstood the Jewish texts, as did Christians from our perspective. As they, from our perspective, they, they, they misunderstood the whole Torah, the whole Bible, but that's okay. No one's blaming that. Well, no one's blaming them. Sorry, that's a different topic. But what's a discussion discussion for another time? We talked about Christianity uh, as opposed to. But certainly, yes, the perspective of uh, internal condemnation. So, like, you won't find such a thing in Judaism. It does not exist. Okay. Um. Okay. So. What happens? Okay. Hell. Hell. That is horrific punish and health. Okay, that's what we're saying. And health. Yes. <laughs> now you can do whatever you want. No, there's 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 cause. You we'll talk about it in a moment. Okay, so why do we think it's so important? That's the our next question is let's look at this um, text number two. Um text number two on page one thirty four. Do not consider the punishments described in the Torah as comparable to penalties a person incurs for disobeying the decree of a mortal king. Not at all. Rather, they are completely natural consequences. For one who fails to observe a Torah commandment is denied the good that naturally results from its observance. It is comparable to one who fails to sow his field and therefore cannot reap a harvest one who fails to wear clothes and is then cold. It is as natural consequence as the warmth provided by fire, the wetness of water, and the situation satiation of bread. The same way it is the nature of each mitzvah to provide the positive consequences that are promised for its observance or the negative consequences that are stated regarding its transgression. Okay? Clear? So, yeah? Let me explain. Yes, huh? Clear as mine. Clear, clear as mine. Yeah, look, look over here. Let's look at this next. Um, when you look at this particular thing. So this, look at text three. It will help us understand it. 
There's a statement from Ethics of Our Father, Pirkei Avot. Ethics of Our Fathers says as follows, the reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. The ret retribution for a sin is a sin. What do you mean? The reward for a mitzvah, the reward for a dollar is a dollar. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. How does it mean the reward for a mitzvah is a mitzvah? Or the reward for a sin is a mitzvah? You know, what it's telling us is follows. There's two ways when you work, there's two ways of how you can work and make money. Okay? There's the more old traditional way, and there's the more modern type of way, or the farmer's way and everybody else's way, really. The old traditional way is you needed food. So what did you do? You would go and plant your food in the ground, and you would milk your cow, and then you would uh, take care of your, 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 your sheep or whatever, and then you would have what you needed. And then you would chop down trees, and you would build yourself a house, and your work, as a, a direct result of your work, you had your house and you had your meal. That's one thing. So what was the, the result of the work was the mitzvah. It has the deed itself. So the planting itself was your reward. What's the reward of, for planting tomatoes? Tomatoes. You get for your tomatoes to eat. You plant tomatoes, you get tomatoes. Now, on the other hand, some people go to work. Can you money? Now, you could use money for all types of things, the reward, whatever you want it to be. So we're saying the reward of the mitzvah is a direct result of what it is. Sometimes you work, you make money, and you buy food with the money. It's indirect. However, sometimes you sow, and you reap, and you have food. It's much more direct. The food itself is coming directly as a result of your work, you producing that which you need to survive, that which you need to sustain yourself. You produce the outcome, okay? This is the DIY generation, do-it-yourself generation. We're not a, do a DIY generation, not that the choice thing, but what's the result of the mitzvah? The mitzvah means a connection. So the word mitzvah means connection. What are we trying to do? We're created to connect to God. The result of when we do a mitzvah is we form a connection with God, but automatically make some positive trust. So he's saying like this, don't say if a moral king makes a law and he says, if, if you do this, you're going to get this punishment. It's totally different. Why is it totally different? Because the punishment might not relate at all to your transgression. They say now that parenting tip that I once learned is if you can try to make your rewards and punishment as connected to the, the 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 act that they did, so you know you behave nicely, you get to have something in connection with good behavior, connection to what you did. Um, as a result of you know um, you spoke out of place, okay, so now go and you know jump or stand in the corner. There's no connection. Spoke out of place, so now teach them something about speaking. Make the result be directly connected. Right, it helps people learn when the result, when it's a cause and effect. But Judaism, Torah, and mitzvot is a natural cause and effect approach. So, if you don't uh, work, you won't have money. Right? You won't have money to feed yourself. What's is it a punishment? No, it's not a punishment. It's a direct result. It's a it's a consequence. Thank you. It's a direct cause, direct consequence. So when we look at Torah and mitzvot, we say that Torah and mitzvot, God has said, do you want to have goodness? Here is the way to goodness in your life. If you don't want to have goodness, don't do or transgress these, and it makes you live the opposite of a happy life or a fulfilled life or success in your life. Okay? That's what it means. The same thing is when it comes to the world to come. When we do a mitzvah now, there's two types of rewards. So, for example, we say that if somebody gives charity, they get paid back when they do charity. But if somebody uh, dies a mitzvah of tefillin, what's the result of tefillin? What's the reward for tefillin? Ah, that's a connection that you're forming with God, which we cannot feel while you're in this world. That reward you can only feel when you're going to the world to come. What if somebody 
if somebody transgresses one of the mitzvot, some it's not kosher, for example. So that you can't feel in this world. And the result of that is felt in the, uh, in the world to come. That's an example of, it's a direct result. Are we saying that there's no hell? No. The hell is the afterlife where you feel the spiritual impact of things that you could not. Some of them, even though you may have got some of the reward for the things that you did here, you still, even for charity, where you get some reward here, charity, you get more reward over here, and in the world to come. All mitzvahs, and all mitzvahs give you both reward here and the world to come. So the reward in the world to come is far greater. And so to the consequence, the negative feeling is also far greater. So when we do, if we keep Shabbos, so we go to Shul, when we learn, there's a direct positive result. That is for here and for the world to come. People that put on tefillin every day, we don't just say, okay, in the world to come, you'll feel the result. No, we'll say there's a direct result. It makes you have a better life. You have a life which is connected to meaning, and it affects everything else in your life. Every time you do one mitzvah, the other meaning of skar mitzvah mitzvah is when you do one good deed, it affects all the other parts of your life. So if I do, if I put on fill in, I want to think, hold on, I'm connected to God. I live a life which is more interested to God, more peace of mind, more tranquility, all those other things. That lives me, allows me to live a happier life. That's one part. That's a, the reward in this world. And that also rebounds back in a greater way in the world to come. Okay? Is that clear? Anything that you don't do, you're going to go for rehabilitation. Yes. Now, whenever you talk about thing, you always have to remember that people are not judged. There's no black and white sheet of how we judged. It's not as though we have a, a, a you know a dollar for dollar. One person's sin and another person's what we're going to call sin transgression. I'll call transgression pet is totally different to the other persons because where you were brought up and the circumstances and it's an it's 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 a totally different each person is is judged on a level that fits their model if you weren't brought up religious and you uh, and you're slowly trying to grow in your path it doesn't the, you you get the positive rewards for it not necessarily the negative rewards but it means that we've got to all continue growing, no matter where, what level you are. You've got to grow on the level that you're able to grow. That's our job. I okay. Like that. I like that we're all being assessed by our individuality. Well, this is another part of what I said before. What I said before is, if God is truly kind, God is also, what another fundamental belief is about Judaism is God is all-knowing. So if God is all-knowing, he knows. I just turned it off for a moment. I'm just a bit hot. Sorry. I'll turn it back on if people get to call. Are you okay? Say that. Say that. Okay. I guess I'm just a bit. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. I said it'll make you fall asleep either way. But it's, uh, that is make. Okay. Um, if we believe that God is all infinite. He's all knowing, he's all kind, then automatically you're going to say, he's not going to judge you the same way he judges somebody else. That means he knows your feeling, he knows your struggles, he understands what you went through, and therefore he judges you. Actually, this is not part of this class, but I'm going to add it in because it's connected. And there's a whole teaching, which I don't, I learned it a while ago, where the Rebbe teaches that a person judges themselves unknowingly. In other words, a person you're not going to be judged by some great rabbi that doesn't understand your predicament, that never had the same struggles as you. Actually, you judge yourself. You judge yourself because you're the only one that, and that, that properly understands themselves. Um, so when you talk about actual reward and punishment or, or transgression, one of the things that we teach people is if you want to, <laughs> you want to have a good afterlife, try to judge people positively in this world, no matter what level of Judaism you're holding on. That's a separate thing. Always make sure you personally are growing. But also, always try to judge people positively. Don't judge people at all. Don't judge people at all, yes. But don't be judgmental. But we all judge people. But if you're going to judge, don't judge. be judgmental. Why? Because it's going to come back to bite you. If you're naturally a judgmental person, then when you come up to heaven 
and you're going to see what you see is a video of somebody else's life, which is really your own life, but it, it, you don't know it. And you ask, what do you think of this person? Is this person, if you're naturally judgmental, you're going to say, oh, that person's good. Look, look, look at all those things, they're wrong. If you're naturally a non judgmental person, you'll say, I don't know, maybe the person uh, wasn't brought up with that. Or, yeah, you'll find all the ways to answer the issues because you're not a judgmental person. And therefore, it actually eases your own suffering that you have to go through because you haven't gone through that derail. But it, 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 it's anyway, it's a little bit of distraction from the class, but I think it's an important part. Okay, so here what we've seen is uh, how things are actually changed. Um, so when we look at this, the, the punishment elements of Judaism, if a person steals, for example, they have a punishment in this world and the punishment in the world. Now, what's the punishment for stealing in this world besides what they get caught by the, by the police? So they don't get caught by the police. They have to live with that guilty feeling whether they know about it or not. They live with a, a sense of I am of uncleanliness. They degrade, they disrespect themselves. They don't have self-respect for who they are, what they are. And then also afterwards, they they have that. If you are not nice to the people around you, what's the direct result for being not nice to the people around you? People will be not nice back to you. If you're toxic in your marriage and your relationship, people will be toxic back to you. That's the way it is. And um, so you're seeing the direct results cause and effect, that's the same thing, um, say, same thing. If you look at, for example, a concept of Shabbos, so people think, what's the reward of Shabbos today, by the way? I don't, I could go on for, and I do. When you talk about Shabbos, the rewards of Shabbos, the time for introspection, the time to calm, the time for family, all the benefits, the time to connect with God, all those benefits that Shabbos is so important, we miss out if we don't respect Shabbos. Okay. Okay, the, um, now this particular PowerPoint I think is an important afterlife is not existing world that we enter after that left, it's one we create. That's an important thing. What, it's, it's what, what we've learned so far is based on what we've said, we come to a new understanding of the afterlife. The afterlife is not this, this there's, they tell a story of the sisterhood you know, this uh, woman's fundraising group that uh, were going on a, a, a on a bus together. They were traveling and uh, there was a bus accident and the bus fell off a hill and they all died and they came up to heaven and they all judged favorably. But they said, listen, there's not enough space for all of you right now to come to heaven. So we're going to just, just go to hell for a few minutes while we make some space for you in heaven. Anyway, a few minutes later, the angels come back to hell and they see that everything has changed. Why? Because the ladies had already made a fundraiser for air conditioning and installed air conditioning. So what's the point? The point is that when we look at, we think we're going somewhere, that we, yes, we are going somewhere. But the experiences and the struggles are created by us in our life. We create a new existence. We create a parallel life for ourselves. And our, react, our actions over here, it's not, there's no list of this is the punishment for that and that's the punishment for that. It's like elements, but it's basically consequences and as a, a direct result. So when you understand that heaven and hell are really one of the same thing, heaven and hell is really the afterlife and the life that you uh, that you experience. There are different places, there are different experiences, and you go through it at different times. So let's look at when. When does one go through uh, the heaven and hell? We'll talk about it for a moment. Let's first look at this particular uh, statement from the Sfat Emmett, one of the Geri Rebbe's in text four on page 136. He says, the fires of Gehenom, hell, are stoked in direct proportion to the degree to which the wicked fan the fiery passions. Accordingly, we must say that Gan Eden para paradise is amplified by the tremendous passion that the righteous invest in their Torah study and the performance of Hashem's commandments. 
They take great pleasure and delight in God himself, and their deeds generate a corresponding abundance of light and Ganadin. In other words, we're not saying, once again, when you read this paragraph without what I just said, you would take this little paragraph totally out of perspective. You would say, oh, it's saying that there's big fiery things. No, it's saying that the fire is a description of a certain heat that you, you, you feel. And we'll understand what that means in, in a moment. But that is created directly as a result of what you cause. And the same thing is with the mitzvah. Okay, so let's talk about what the experiences can look like a bit. Now that we've given really a bit of an introduction to all them, which to not just introduction, it's more of a, a, a overview of these things. So, look into text five, please. What is hell? But before we discuss hell, let's look into this Talmud. The Talmud tells us about a man by the name of Akher, Elisha bin Abuah. Elisha bin Abuah um, was a sage, and he was one of the greatest sages in his time. And he had a spiritual experience that he was not ready for, and it made him go a bit cuckoo. Him, Rabbi Akiva, and a few others, and he came out and he became a, a heretic. He started denying things, and he did terrible things. He did terrible things. And he, and he fell from a really high level to a low level. And there was an issue. So let's look at this text. Elisha bin Abu, by the way, we have fascinating stories about this particular individual because he fell from being one of the greatest rabbis to one of the worst people in his time. Fell really bad. So Elisha bin Abu was a former Mishnai he said he had, he had a... It says that he entered into the Pardes. He entered into, he had a spiritual, he had a spiritual vision that he wasn't ready for and, and it messed up, messed him. And he, he played with Kabbalistic stuff that he shouldn't have played with, basically. Um, he wasn't ready for it and hadn't, didn't have a good impact on him. There was a few other people, um, okay. Except for one of the people that, that did have a good impact on was Rabbi Akiva. He was ready for it. He was properly prepared for it. He wasn't looking just to try to get pleasure. He was doing it for positive reasons, which was the main thing. So Elisha bin Abu was a former Mishnahic sage who turned to such public heresy and treachery that he was derogatively nicknamed Akher. Akher, he's, the rabbis changed his name from Elisha, one of the greatest prophets, and they changed his name and they called him Akher, which means other. They don't want to even say his name, they just called him the other. When Acher died, the heavenly court declared, we will not afflict him with judgment in Gehenna, nor will we permit him to enter paradise. So he was stuck between both, both places. The reasoning, we will not afflict him with judgment because he studied much Torah, but we will not permit him to enter paradise because he sinned, I don't know how to pronounce that word, egregiously. Acher's former disciple, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir is one of the greatest rabbis in the time of the Mishnah, it's one of the most quoted rabbis, said, better that he indeed be judged and punished so that he may enter paradise. And the Torah tells us, the, the Talmud goes on to say that Rabbi Meir said he was the principal student of this man, and he ends up becoming one of the great rabbis, but he relearned with this individual before he lost it. And he said, when I die, I'm going to pray. Because what happened was, he said, Elisha bin Avua, he knew that he was stuck between all, both worlds. And he says, when I die, I'm going to pray that he should go into hell. Why am I going to die that he should go into hell? And then there was another rabbi that came and says, and he said, you'll see that when I die from Elisha bin Avua's grave, smoke will come out. Which will show you that he entered into hell. I there is no hell. Sorry. No, no, no. There is hell, but not the hell that other the people understand. Right. So yeah. there is a hell. No, so let me go. There is a hell. A hell is a cleansing process where we revisit yeah. to rehab. Yeah, yeah, but it's not a fiery place that you go just to suffer for the sake of suffering. Internal damnation. We'll see what it means. 
It's a temporary experience. Okay. So he's saying that to not go anywhere is worse. Why? Because then he can't move on to the next stage. So it is not necessarily as horrible or as much suffering, but in a way you're like in no man's land, which is even harder. And then it tells us that um, later on, another great disciple who says, when I die, I'm going to pray that he should go, um, that, that the fire should stop and he should go to Ganadin to, to paradise and the fire stopped or the, the, and the smoke that was coming out of Akhra's grave for a long time stopped. Ganadin. Yeah, so he said, I'm going to pray that he should go from hell to heaven. Okay, that was the next student. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's look at what is it. It's not eternal damnation. A Gehenna is a soul rehabilitation. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in a moment. It depends on the individual, but there is a limit. Okay, for most people, there's a, a limit. For someone like Akhar, there wasn't a limit because he didn't fall into the regular category. It cleanses the core and it always is for a holy purpose. So what, what is, what is, we call it, we sometimes, some, some, some rabbis like to call it a washing machine, right? If you can imagine, so to speak, God forbid, what does a washing machine have to do? What does the sock do that it deserves to go through this whole process? What happened? It got dirty. The sock gets dirty. I, and therefore it goes through this washing cycle. I like to, this, uh, to, to I understand it a bit differently. The way I understand the, the whole thing is this. You see, as a soul, you are fully in line with Hashem before you come down to this world. You're fully in line with Hashem. You come to this world, and as we explained in our first class, to reach greater heights. But what happens to us is we lose part when we're down here, we lose that feeling of connection to Hashem. And the more we've sinned, the further away we've gone away from that true reality. The, the more mitzvahs we've done, the more kindness, the less ego we've had, the more we've connected to Hashem, Torah, mitzvot, help people, etc., the more we've stayed true to our own reality. And when we come back afterwards, we re-enter that pure, true reality and we see the truth, the truth of Hashem and how many of the things that we were running off in this world are fake and not true and bad. And we now have to go through a, a whole rehab and cleansing system in order to get up back in line with who we are. And yes, when we come out the other side afterwards, we're on a much higher level than we started. And that's the purpose of our suffering or whatever. This double suffering, the first, so to speak, call it suffering. You first go through difficulty, the challenges in this world. And then you go through the challenges in the world to come, right? In the afterlife. And you, some people would say, a soul says, as we said in our first class, a soul says, I'd rather just stay here. I don't want to come. And God says, no, life is, you, you weren't created as a soul in order just to live and enjoy. Live, you experience life before death, life before uh, physical life. And then you have to come here, go through the challenges of life, and then reintegrate in the world of souls into the world where all these physical things don't bother you. Where now, if you lived a life at Sadiq, what's a righteous person? He never really, he never really fully adapted to this world, so to speak. He adapts to this world, but he never allowed this world to take over him. So he, and at one point, did he get allow anything in this world to come between him and Hashem, for example? Hashem tells him to do something, he only does that. He never allowed his own ego to come between anything between him and his fellow man. That's why it's sudden. So therefore, what happens is he doesn't have to go through this whole rehabilitation system. But a person that got totally confused in this world, but totally lost, until they find their way back, takes a while. And they have to re slowly re uh, what's the right word? realign themselves. Thank you. They have to realign themselves with their true reality. But when they do that, they now are doing it on a much higher level. So that's why we say um, that a great tzaddik, everyone goes through hell. But some people go through hell for a split second. Some people go through hell, they bypass it. Some people go through hell for a few minutes. And some people have to go through a long process of hell. 
right? The more we've given into our physical, natural desires and not had control and not lived a life in truth, the longer our time of suffering and harder it is for us to realign ourselves with our true selves. So the further away, if we can live in this world true to who we are, really to our soul and not allow our physical reality to overtake us, staying true to our physical reality is expecting it understanding that there's greatness. And over here we have ways to connect to God, which is much greater than anywhere else, but not allowing it to overtake us. That's when when we come to the world to come, we're sweet. And that's what a tzaddik is. A tzaddik is their whole physical life, they were fully in tune with who they are. They never lost focus on that. They never allowed the physical world to take over them. That's the difference. So they never got dirtied by it. That's what Kafa Killer is. Kafa Killer is, she was asking what's Kafa, Kafa Killer. Kafa Killer, we talked about a back and forth. What's a back and forth? When we talk about going through hell, we think about the word Kafa Killer. Kafa Killer means you're going back and forth. What? You're looking who you are, what you become, and the regret and the struggle that you have to realign yourself with. Well, this is a true reality, and I can't believe I did that. And you know, when you have this most terrible regret, you know, when you've done something, you like kind of wish you hadn't done it in the most extreme way. That's the type of suffering that we go through from the understand. The biggest suffering that we go through is the regret of how lost we became or how confused we became. And as once again, sometimes we could see our whole picture and say it wasn't our fault. That's what we were taught. But still, we have to. It's like, you know, sometimes you do something and you, you didn't know and you regret it. But that's OK. As long as you have that regret and part of that. Is when you, what, what, what the hell is that we're going through? Yeah. Um, this Kafka person was the original rabbi. That yeah. Was, and they said, look at what sort of horrible things he did. It, it is. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, we don't know which ones are exactly. We know that he tra he he went to transgressing all the mitzvot of the Torah. So there's some versions that said that he did things as bad as murder. Okay. And there's some things that's so that's less clear, but some things say we definitely know that there's a famous story of him desecrating the Shabbos with his student Rabbi Meir walking beside him. Rabbi Meir, he still kept all his Torah knowledge. Um, there's once we discuss him, we could discuss him for a long time. He's a topic unto himself. Um, in my personal opinion. Could he have become schizophrenic or bipolar? Because that actually happens to people now that I know. Yes. I is it is it possible that 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 he can could happen? Yes, but okay. It's it's an interesting discussion once we start getting into it's just a, um once we start getting into yeah, listen. It's all it's all it's it's interesting discussion. Um Let's just leave it as simple. Uh, anything. Down, exactly, exactly. Well, we understand that that it was it was an intentional uh, decision. Um, there was another one of the people that says one of the other people. There was four of them that went into this vision, the spiritual vision. They saw the Rabbi Kiva. It says he came in in peace and left in peace. He had the right intentions and he went in. The other three suffered. One died, didn't come out. He died as a result. Um, Rabbi uh, Alisha ben Avua became a heretic, and the other one lost it. So he stayed alive, but he went a bit in sugar. Okay, so we don't say that about uh, Alisha ben Avua. So that's, I would say, probably not. Even though, okay, and also, okay. So the only person that actually went to the problem is Rabbi Akiva. No one actually went there. No, Rabbi Akiva went there while he was in the physical life and he was able to come out and he was unaffected negatively. When you have as a physical person yes. from the Talmud, well, that, that the Torah tells us. No, there could be that there was other. That we, we know that the Baal Shem Tov and other... Well, we don't know what the Rebbe, maybe. The Baal Shem Tov, we have lots of stories of him having different types of spiritual experiences. But a lot of these experiences... I can't, I can't, but this is, that's what we're told about them. Okay, let's look at how uh, Hasidus describes these texts. 
Gehenna. Um, text six, the purpose of Gehenna is to refine the soul and rid of, of any sickness that is contracted. This is similar to the process of smeltering silver, wherein the dross and the sediment is burned away in a furnace, leaving the silver clean and free of impurity. So why do we call it a furnace? Because what do you do when you have a real, you all been to uh, Ballarat, to, to Sovereign Hill, and you see when they melt, the, the, they melt the, uh, the gold, and what does it do? It also cleanses it. it. It's able to get out all the impurities from it. They come out. So the same thing is we call it a furnace because it's an experience of cleansing, right? Hot water cleans better and destroys at the same time sometimes, but it's a cleansing experience. So that's what we say. Similarly for the soul, to be able to experience the light of the supernal pleasures and bask in God's radiance, it must first be refined in the spiritual fire of Gehenom, whereby the negative is purged from the positive. Do you understand how that says? You want to go on to have a really good positive uh, spiritual experience in connection to Hashem, you have to get rid of all your nonsense, all your issues, all your ba baggage, all your dirt, all your schmutz that you've been through this world. You, you got caught up in all types of false things in this world. And you have to now realign yourself. That's what we do. You have to go through a cleansing process. Okay, and now you understand that text was the Hasidic text. Now you understand why Chabad has a different approach because that becomes a central text within Chabad. It's all about uh, cleansing that we have to. Okay, now let's go a bit further. When we think about this, um, should we read this next text? Okay. The next text tells us that, um, I'll read it, but it's a bit of a long one. I might not read the whole thing. This is from Arya Kaplan on page 139. The bottom is text seven. Then an individual will also see himself in a new light. Even in our mortal physical state, looking at oneself can sometimes be pleasing and at other times very painful. Imagine standing naked before God with your memory wide open, completely transparent, without any jamming mechanism or reduce involved to diminish its force. You will remember everything you ever did. You will see it in the light of the unshaded spirit, or if you will, in God's own light that shines from one end of the creation to the other. The memory of every good deed and mitzvah will be the sublimest of pleasures. But your memory will also be open to all things of which you were ashamed. They cannot be rationalized away or dismissed. You'll be facing yourself, fully aware of the consequences of all your deeds. We all know the terrible shame and humiliation experience when one is caught in the act of doing something wrong. Imagine being caught by one's own memory with one with no place to escape. A number of our great teachers write that the fire of Gehenna is actually the burning shame one experiences because of one's sin. Of course, these concepts as used by our sages may also contain deeper mysteries and meanings. But a major ingredient of this fire may be shame. How else could one characterize the agony of unconcealed shame upon a soul? We are taught that the judgment of the wicked last 12 months. The pain eventually subsides. So that's the point. It's about, yes. <laughs> all right i don't know if it does but some some people are like that we have politicians in particular right until part of poli political po politicians training is that they 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 promise very good the promise the world and forget and forget that you promised or or do things and then forget that you that's that's part of uh, and i don't think it's this individual alone i think it's all i think it's most of them most i won't say all but most of them um so soul catharsis the painful process cleans the soul and this is the point it's only there in order to cleanse now what are you trying to cleanse for if i say it's linakot it's to get you out the other side you want to come clean on the other side so you only clean. That's why we don't talk about internal dam uh, damnation. It's only temporary. So how long does it last for? Look inside text 
Eight. The maximum sentence, the maximum se sentence of the wicked in Gehenna is 12 months. So the 12 months as we know it. Yeah. yeah, okay. Good question. The good question. Um, okay, so what's what the answer to your question is? Question Yana asks is what type of what type of 12 months is it? And the answer is what feels to us like 12 months. So it's not something that we can truly understand because we say that only the physical world, but in this world we have time as we understand it. Time when you leave it is very different. So can people that have passed and connect with us in our time? Yes. But they're affected. It's almost like we say that a person sees the entire life in a single moment. What does it mean to see your entire life in a single moment? Because at that moment, you go beyond time. You enter into soul space. space. But in soul space, you, you've got to get through all the processes, one process at a time. And we say the most that a person can have experienced or gone through in general, and there's exceptions to this, but in general, the most the person could have done wrong could take them up to 12 months in physical correlating time. So it's not actual physical time, it's correlating physical time. And therefore, if, if you're going to be doing within the first 12 months, or you're going to be doing college for the 12 months, well, however time is affected by them, by, by up there, it affects them in the same way. In other words, because they're beyond time, they also know the future. They also know what you're going to do in the future. So that also affects the future, affects them the same way as the past affects them or the present affects them. Because they're beyond time. But their future is after they've gone through a planting process. Yes, their future is. No, no, their, their current moment is beyond our future. Why are we comparing them to ourselves? Okay, why? Because, well, you asked two questions. You asked, is their 12 months the same as our 12 yes. months? And my answer is yes and no. The answer is yes, because it goes through, they also go through a similar type of 12 experience of time as we have it, but not the same exact because they're actually beyond time. But so, so they, we're, we're living not parallel to them. We're not living parallel to them in the same way. Now, as they could tap into our time, but they really are beyond the time. Okay. It's difficult for us to explain. Because our time, what well, our actions affect them. That's the next later part of this class. Just like your actions in this world affects your the actions of your beloved. I'll talk about that a bit more last week. We've touched on it in the previous classes. I'll touch on it again at the end of this class. So let's look at this 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 whole idea. In text eleven, we read how if it cleanses the soul, it's only there for temporarily. And therefore, we only say Kaddish. We say the Yorotet is after the first 12 months. We say, it says this in the Mishnah. Kol Yisrael yesh lehem chelek l'olam abba. Every single Jew has a portion in the world to come. Uh, page 141, text 9. Shunemar l'olam yukshuaret. Your people, all of them, are all righteous. They they shall inherit the land forever. In other words, what is they shall inherit the land? You sure are it, the afterlife. They are a branch of my plotting, the work of my hands in which I take part. In other words, no one goes to eternal dam damnation forever. It's only a process that you have to go through temporarily. Now, it feels like in time it correlates to 12 months of our time, and therefore we do Kaddish, for example, up to 12 months. Now, normally, we only do it for 11 months because we're trying to help them from those 12 months. So how do we know here to say it for 11 months or 12 months for that person? How do we know here when to say cut is for 11 or 12 months? Okay, so unless we know of a person doing a particular sin that it says that you should do it for 12 months, then we only say 11 months. I don't really want to go publicly what those things are. I spoke about that. Um, for example, um, so somebody that is 
is cremated is one of the examples. The person has to go through a greater cleansing process. And therefore, one of the only things that can help them is 12 months of, of, of Kaddish, which unfortunately is usually not the case because if 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 the relatives are allowing their relative to be cremated, they're probably not going to do Kaddish for 12 months. That's public knowledge. What if this person has done committed murder? And only they are, are aware of what they do. So, you, so, so there, that's the exact reason why we only do 11 months. The so reason why, why do we do 11 months? Because we say that most people are out of there by 11 months. And therefore, we're giving our parent the benefit of the doubt to say that we're sure that they're going to be out of there by 11 months. And they don't need us to say college for 12 months. That's why we stop. Unless we're aware that they did something like murder or something else which is very harmful to them that is not necessarily like murder, but which is considered really harmful, then we would say cut it for 12 months. But otherwise, we judge them positively and we say they didn't. And therefore, no matter what sins they did or the sins that they did, we say that. And there's sometimes, if you want to do the benefit, you know, sometimes the harder it is to say cut it because the person wasn't such a good person, the more they need it. But who wants to say college for a person that wasn't such a good person? Okay. Um, I think we're going to just finish off this particular section. And then next week, we'll discuss a little bit more of what's share in the world to come and how we can help. We'll go over this, this idea of helping uh, the Kaddish and we'll revisit an idea in Kaddish. Then we'll go on to reincarnation. Uh, we might get to reincarnation next week. Definitely be talking about heaven and what the heaven idea is. Okay, so what happens? We've we, we read stage one. Stage one, what we've learned tonight is that after a person passes away, every single person goes through something called Gehenom. What's Gehenom? It's a process where they have to be rehabbed and cleansed, readjust to normal spiritual life to be able to live that 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 that, that cleansing point. It takes up to 12 months, no longer. So and we understand that one second, two points, God is eternally good, kind, and therefore it's only there for our own benefit. And number two is his is, is, is all-knowing, and therefore it cannot be that a person is getting misjudged as a result. There's no black and white list. It's all a direct correlation to the life that you created over here. You create your own life in the afterworld. Okay. Yes. So do we have now, let's say, a month, for a month that we need to pray for him, for him to transfer from. So how how does that? The, we, we ah okay. So we say it takes up to eleven to twelve months. What he needs to do. So he goes. We 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 need to pray for him. We'll talk about that more next week. But that's why we do things like Kaddish and things like that. Wow. That helps them. But I'll talk about it. I didn't get time to, 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 to do this, but I'll talk about it more next week. But if okay? there's no signs to say Kaddish... Kaddish is only one element of it. Kaddish is a small element of it, to be honest. So today, the, at the table, there was a daughter. She, she said Kaddish? No, she didn't say Kaddish. Did somebody say Kaddish? Somebody said something at the, at the, after they finished their, that was Kaddish, I don't know, so I couldn't hear. Um, so what they're saying is at the final. Usually they say Kaddish, was it, was it, yeah, it probably would have so been Kaddish. Somebody said. Yeah. I don't even know who it was, but somebody did say. Some relative can. can yeah. Can, no? A relative can say Kaddish, yes. You get somebody to say but Kaddish. That's just on the day. And if nobody, and if there's no one to say Kaddish, um, you've got to hire somebody. You hire, hire somebody. Yeah, thank we'll talk you, about sir. that in a moment. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody online for joining. If anybody has any questions, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Yochanan. Thank you, Ronit. Laila Tov. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Good night. That was making fun. Not to my lessons, I've been listening before.